our tagline is a foundation of strength leads to a future of confidence and that's because we want to find one thing that these kids are doing build all around how's it going everyone you're tuned in to whistle cake martial arts radio episode 722 with my guest today sensei daryl balasheski i am jeremy lesniak i'm your host here for the show I'm the founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts and traditional martial artists, probably like you. If you want to see everything we're doing, visit whistlekick.com. It's our online home. It's the place you're going to find all the things that we work on. It's also the place you're going to find our store, where we sell everything from protective equipment to fun apparel, training programs, and a bunch of other stuff. If you pick something up, make sure you use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. And it lets me know that you listen to the show and you buy stuff. That's a good thing for us. We we need that feedback. This show has its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We release two brand new shows each and every week. We've been doing that for years. And the entire purpose behind everything we do, well, we're working hard to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world, people just like you. If that means something to you, if you want to support the work that we do, there are lots of things you can do. You can make a purchase, maybe tell a friend about what we're doing, or you could join our Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. It's a place where we can post exclusive content. And if you contribute as little as two bucks a month, you get access to some of it. And there are higher tiers with more stuff, more value. You know we're all about value over here at Whistlekick. So go check that out. If you want the full list, all the things you can do from the paid to the free, the easy to the maybe a little bit more time intensive go to the family page, whistlekick.com slash family. If you are part of our family, you've probably been over there already, but maybe you're newer and you haven't checked it out yet. Whistlekick.com slash family is where we give you all the things that you can do to help us in our mission. And we also sprinkle in some other cool, fun stuff. We update it once a week, at least. And we even give you the date and time at the top that we updated it. So you're not digging through hunting for, you know, where, what, did, what cool thing did Jeremy bury in here this time? Um, I don't want to waste your time. Today's guest, Sensei Balashevsky, had a great conversation with him. This, this is someone who has been around, has done some great stuff. And I've had the opportunity not to train directly with him, but I've talked to people who have. And I'll be honest, they say great things. We had a wonderful conversation, just as I would have expect, expected. <laughs> and I think that you're going to enjoy it. So stick around and I'll see you at the back end. Sensei Balashevsky, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for coming on. My favorite part about what I do is that there is variety, right? Like I get to talk to people all over the world, training for all different reasons, with all different origin stories, in all different arts. And so that's why we, we you know, the, the, the first question that I usually ask is generally pretty obvious, but I like to ask it in different ways. You know, and, and I'm sure you can guess that first question is what, like, how'd you get started? Right. Yep. But I like to ask it sometimes. Imagine that we were at, let's say, like a, a, a convention for a comic book based on your life. And people were, were talking about issue one, the first issue of your martial arts journey in graphic form. What would be happening in that issue? Well, that would be back to 1978. Um, my brother and I and my next door neighbor watching Kung Fu Theater on Saturdays. Uh, I remember lots of Bruce Lee movies watching. And uh, I grew up near a few rough neighborhoods and there was always issues. So my older brother started martial arts a couple months before me. and. Um, that brought me into it back then. Um, ADD and OCD kid back in the 70s, I was all over the place. Uh, martial arts definitely helped me. Um, I also, you know, back then, it, I'm going to straight up right from the beginning say it took me 16 years to get blood. Wow. Because I didn't believe in myself. And it was, it was a struggle. Lots of things were a struggle for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, thankfully, I kept coming back and kept trying and, 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 you know, 
maybe the school I was in uh, did things a little differently than we do today, but um, I stuck it out with them and um, had a few gaps in my training, but one of their instructors showed me the light and slowly walked me through it. So starting in the 70s, mostly because of Kung Fu Theater on Saturday, um, it, it was an interesting time back then. I'm always fascinated with anybody who started as a kid, you know, older kid, but still a kid. You know, sometimes we, we can consider 15, 16, 17, you know, younger adults. And in the context of martial arts, they're generally in adult classes. So I, I don't find that as interesting. But someone at your age starting, I think, really anything before 85, 86 was pretty uncommon. Yes. Yep. Were you thrown in with adults or were you at one of the very unique schools that offered kids programs? So back then we only had one class. It was Monday and Wednesday from 7.30 to 9. There wasn't very many students, but there were, were you know maybe five to six in a class and it was mixed. I was 12 at the time, so yeah. it's not that you know I was much older you know, or much younger. Right. Um, but, you know, yeah, so I remember, you know, I was a white belt and there were adults in there, adult black belts. It was all just one big mish, mismatch. And, and what, what were you doing? Was it karate? It was, it was karate. Yep. Sure. Okay. Karate. Yep. okay. And you said your brother had started a few months before. Was he encouraging you to join? Were your parents seeing changes in him that they were in, encouraging you to join? Like where, where did that translate through? I don't remember him encouraging me to join, but I remember him going and me really wanting to, to do it too. Um, the three of us in my neighbor watched that Kung Fu theater almost yeah. every Saturday. It was fantastic. Uh, sprinkled in with a little Bruce Lee movies. Uh, um, Kill or be killed. That was yeah. a good movie back in the day, right? Um, and so it was my excitement for watching him, what he was doing and wanting to do it. So, you know, I don't know how much they really understood back in the 70s how impactful martial arts was going to be on everybody. Yeah. It, it, it's so interesting to look at that, that dynamic, that age group that you were, because let's face it, that age demographic is the, you know, th there's such a dip, right? We get kids and then they hit adolescence and they drop and they start to come back in later teen years, you know, not, not at the numbers in, in most programs that you see in, in young kids. But when we have folks on the show, and quite often they were influenced by Kung Fu Theater. Yep. Starting in that somewhere, I mean, we've, we've heard from some as young as nine, but generally it's that 12 to 15 year old group in the 70s. And I, I just, I find it really interesting that that set of programming spoke to that age group and encourage them to train. And I think it's responsible for far more martial artists than we realize. Just, and that's based on anecdote from this show. Hmm. So you get going, you're doing it. Did, did you fall in love instantly or did it take some time? So I loved pieces of it and hated pieces of it. Hmm. Okay. So lack of confidence, which a lot of people have, right? Um, mm -hmm. in, depending on, on who the instructors are at the time. Um, I hated the contact. I really, really did. And how could you do martial arts without contact, right? Um, and that was, was a big struggle for me over the years because I didn't believe that I could do what I saw everybody else do. Um, I loved kata because there was no contact, right? Uh, kick in the bag was great. Um, but the, the actual contact, um, that, was, that was a tough part for me. Talk to us about your personality as a kid. You know, what were you, what were you like in, in school? Uh, what were you doing outside of martial arts after school? Were you a shy kid? You know, stuff like that. So I was definitely a shy kid. Um, and, you know, the, the OCD and the ADD that I recognize in myself today was a real pain back in the 70s um, because we didn't know what that was back then, right? right. Um, so my dad definitely was the discipline person, which I'm thankful for. I don't have any issues with the discipline I received as a kid because I needed it back then. Um, but I didn't, you know, he didn't believe in himself. I'll be honest. And so that translated, he didn't believe in us a little bit. 
And so that created issues um, with, with my confidence in myself. Yeah. Can, can, can you expand on that a little bit? Because not believing in oneself can take a, a few different, it can manifest in a few different ways. I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind going a little deeper. No, I just, uh, I never looked at myself as someone who succeeded. I got poor grades. Okay. Um, just accepted the fact that I was dumb. I accepted the fact that I couldn't do certain things. And I I guess that's how I went into looking at the martial arts as well as school and everything else. I just accepted that this was where I was at in life. With the exception of the contact, the physical contact, were you finding that martial arts was proving to be a little bit different that you were feeling some competency in what you were doing not back then i'll be honest no. I, oh interesting yeah okay. i know you know it, uh, my wife really helped there's a few things in my life that started turning things for me back in the 80s i read two books um success through a positive mental attitude by william clement stone and uh, how to win friends and influence people, right? That was a great book, right? And that the the success through a positive mental attitude was the first time I actually saw that I could start um, believing in myself and solving my own problems. Um, and so we're talking eighty five to eighty seven, eighty eight, somewhere around there. I was I was starting to slowly turn that around. Did someone encourage you to read those books? Yes. Um, you know, back in that day, the 80s, there was all the, I was just graduating high school in 85. There was all those shows on uh, the uh, real estate, no money down and stuff. But then there was one about William Crumpstone's book and um, Think and Grow Rich, the, uh, the co-author there helped him with uh, success through a positive mental attitude. And I just remember seeing that and saying, you know what, I should read that. And so I did. It sounds like just, just in the, the, the way you're talking about it, that that first book was kind of pivotal. Absolutely. It, it just, it, you know, I, I, I've expressed a few times on the show that there are three books that have really changed my life. It sounds like you're talking about this in a similar way. Absolutely. Yeah, so the uh, success through a positive mental attitude probably had the biggest impact. Throughout that book, they talked about a lot of different people and how they were in one place and they learned to succeed. Um, And then it it took me probably a decade to start really getting fully um, changed from not being believing in myself to actually being able to solve things. and so in that decade, so I'm reading that book in the mid 80s, I met my wife in 1992, mm-hmm. um, 1991, technically, we started dating in 92. Um, and that made a big impact. But I don't mm-hmm. believe she would have liked me back then without that book. Right, right. Things stack up. Right. Now, what's going on with your training at that time? Did, did you continue training after you graduated? So I was in and out for a while because mm. I, I would go for a period of time and then the, the contact and the sparring just, it, it just was overwhelming. Talk, talk about that. How, how much of it is that we're talking about kind of like an old school training style where regardless of age, you're really, you're, you're banging on each other and how much of it was maybe your personality and having a, um, a lower tolerance for it than the average person might? Well, it was definitely, when I first started, there was no gear. Yep. Okay, so you're actually punching each other. It was mouthpiece and cup, but mm-hmm. otherwise that was it. Um, and, you know, the dojo had lots of holes in the walls where people were thrown through and stuff. Um, okay. So maybe maybe kind of a rough and tumble school versus exactly the average school. Okay. Yeah. Not a good combination for you. No, no. Uh, but it was what I believed martial arts was. So I stuck, I, when I, would have one of my breaks. I came back to them because that's what my impression of martial arts was. That's what you saw in Kung Fu theater. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Um, But it was, you know, so if you're, you know, taking a beating and not 
believing in yourself that you could actually do this, you just look down. So you go to class, you take a beating, and then you say to yourself in your mind, you just can't do this. That's what led to my breaks. Um, and then... And, but why did you come back? Right? Like th- that, that's really interesting to me, that there was something so fundamentally difficult for you in this style of training at this school. And it sounds like you went back multiple times, multiple breaks, multiple times Probably resuming. Five. Times. Yep. five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I started in 78, uh, was there for probably a year or so, and then took a break, uh, came back in the early 80s. And then my, my little brother got into it once. And I'm like, oh, you can't pass me out. So I have to get back. <laughs> um, I really, really, really wanted it. I really, I'm amazed that I'm still doing it after all these years. But but that's when I looked at that in my heart and soul, that's what I really wanted to do. I just was, I was struggling, you know, so successive positive mental attitude in the mid 80s changed, met my girlfriend then, and she was on the opposite end of my dad. She was very positive and reinforcing, saying, you can do it. Um, and so, she recognized how important this was to you. Yes. She and supported that. you in that pursuit. Did she have any, do you recall any conversations with her about this, what I think is a pretty fundamental conflict in training philosophy? You wanted something a little less, I'm, am I wrong? You, even though you thought it was the right way, there was some part of you that wanted it to be a little less, you know, rough. I think it's the transition from learning a technique to being able to apply it. Okay. Today, I'm obviously much different than I was back then. Um, Back then, um, I couldn't take pain at all. Okay. I'll tell you an embarrassing story because it's quite different now. And, And I do tell my students this story all the time just to show you how to get through pain. Okay. And this embarrassing story starts when I was 25. And there was a Band-Aid on the back of my hand and my girlfriend and my wife now was about to rip it off. And I said, whoa, wait, wait, soak that first. Uh, you know, it's straight up. I could say that because I'm much different. It was my attitude towards pain that had to change. Okay. And in on December 20th, 2008, eight o'clock in the morning, my brain fell out of my head and I put my hand in a snowblower chute. I was trapped in it for 20 minutes. Um, fire department came and cut me out. That's intense pain. I dealt with it. It wasn't the pain. It was the worry of losing my fingers and how dumb I was at that moment to have done that. And then I have a very fun video that I show the kids right after I tell that very embarrassing Band-Aid story of the doctor. There was four pins sticking through my fingers into the bones to get them to um, come back and he took those um pins out of my fingers without any pain medication whatsoever basically with what looks like the needle nose pliers and he would go in and he was kind of just pulling and wiggling them out no anesthetic at your Um, decision my decision he wanted to i said no why because I had to bridge that pain gap if i'm going to tell my students that you have to suffer not I mean, silly suffer is one thing, but if you're going to, you know, a confrontation, you're getting punched for real. They're really trying to hurt you, right? You got to deal with that pain. And I wanted to go through that without it because that's, Mm. I felt it. It definitely hurt. I'll I'll be honest. (laughs) Um, I do tell all the students to say when it hurts, that felt great. When I was stuck in the snowblower, I said that felt great with the extra adjective on it. Mm. But, um, you know, it's just a changing of your attitude to the pain. So getting back to your original question, um, going from learning a technique to full on sparring, there was a, a pain issue, right? I didn't like that contact, but it was also a, an ability issue that I didn't have at the time. Um, when I teach my students, we go, you know, we, we, we set a new technique for them and then they start doing it slowly so that they can see the success of how they can do that technique and then gradually making it faster and a little harder. One of the things that I've, I've spoken out against and when I teach seminars, it is rooted in 
what you just said, this, this transition between learning a concept, learning a technique, and then the implementation. Most schools rush that process. We, 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 I don't understand why you guys can't do it. We just did a hundred repetitions of this new kick. And then I put you in sparring and you don't do it at all. What's going on? Well, because you've changed the context. Now there's a threat. Now they feel concerned, nervous, fearful. Pain might be involved. And they're going to default to what they know best, which is not the new technique. Right. It, it, the other it, the other avenue there is the competition end of it, right? Mm. I came from a competition school. Where oh, okay. Was, so when you um, are put in the, the sparring match for, for points, you just learn something that you're not good at. You don't do it, right? So there was also that avenue of it where, you know, I wanted to win. I didn't want to lose. I wasn't very good at winning because once again, I didn't believe in myself, but, um, but I still wanted to. So I didn't do that in brand new technique. So between having to go slow, then a little faster and, and your ability was there, then, then you go much faster. Competition. Did you compete early on in your training? I did. I remember being in some um, competitions in the early 80s. Hmm. Um, I know I had two trophies from the beginning, but they weren't very high. Um, and then when I came back in the 90s, after meeting my girlfriend and whatnot, I, I competed then and I got a couple of more trophies. But my issue there was, and I never bridged that gap. Remember the confidence issue I was talking right. about. I remember five point matches, right? I would mm. get three or four points. And I sometimes I was up 3-1, 4-1. Easy to win that, right? But in my head, I started saying, you're not going to win. Mm. And that's where I needed to switch that. Because you hadn't won. Because I hadn't so you won. Couldn't and I didn't believe yeah. in, in my life wasn't that avenue, right? I wasn't right. seeing success in my life. So I, 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 I believed I was going to lose that. And I you know, when you believe something, that's true, right? You, sure. you, you, sure. lose, boom, you lost. And so, so that end of it, I did very poor. Um, now you've mentioned students. And, and so let, let's, let's move here because I think we need a little bit of context for there's some dots I would like to connect. Okay. When did you start teaching and how did that occur? Um, so well, back in the 80s, I was a brown belt. Okay. And I remember that instructor there, he always had us teaching and doing things. So I was assisting teaching. Mm -hmm. I got my black belt in 92. So that connects that 16 year gap. Right. Um, and then I started teaching for them uh, more often at that time. Um, started teaching on my own in 2004. Back then, you know, in the competition school I came from, you weren't allowed to teach without their permission. Mm -hmm. um, very common back in that day. Um, started teaching on my own in 2004 um, and been doing that ever since. At some point, as you're becoming more confident through self exploration and the support of people who love you, did you start to look at your training and your relationship to martial arts differently? Oh yeah. 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 I made my first trip to Okinawa in 2004 as well. Okay. And, um, that whole thing, I am a much different person than I was back then. So, so 92 to 2004, right? There's 12 years in there. And it sounds like there was not only some, some learning, some growth that had to happen, but I would, I would also, I would guess we could term at least some of it as unlearning the removal of some habits some worldview some self-view from from before did it take that 12 is that why it was 2004 when you started teaching for yourself because it took that much time and, and that's not a judgment of length of time it no. took that time for you to get to that place in yourself so um the whole thing back then. So once again, girlfriend started changing. The book changed me. I went to college. I graduated in three years working full time. Um, so stepping stones. Unfortunately, that there was another gap in there even after I got my black belt um, because I opened a pizza place. That was yeah. <laughs> it okay. was what that, I had no. That's out of that's out of left field. We got to hear about that. Okay. So uh, back in 1985, instead of going to college, I started working for Domino's Pizza. Mm -hmm. um, 
thought I enjoyed the uh, the pizza industry and the entrepreneur and becoming a franchise, um, but you know, slowly learning that Domino's Pizza had exploded so much there wasn't very many uh, franchise opportunities in Connecticut. It had been taken up a lot, um, and so it, when I graduated college, I graduated in 1995. It was what I knew. Mm. Okay. So my senior year, I wrote a business plan with my advisor and everything. That was one of the um, classes that was all about small businesses and stuff. And so I wrote a business plan that we implemented when I graduated. Um, I was sad the day I closed. I had it open for four and a half years. I was not sad today. Much better life. You were not 18 when you went to college. If I'm doing my math right, you you waited nine ten years in there seven years seven years started in 92 graduated in 94 okay so you're working at a pizza place what else were you doing in there um so wandering right not really accomplishing a lot the lack of confidence um i tried a few different things um a few different businesses that really just didn't work out um, and so that's when I changed back to, there was a gap from Domino's Pizza. I went back in 91 ish to Domino's Pizza. And that's actually where I met my wife. Okay. Um, she was not an employee there. Her best friend was an employee there. Him and I were hanging out and he introduced me to her and eventually, uh, through lots of convincing on my part, she decided to start dating me. It's, it's interesting how much happened in that year. Yeah. You know, you're, you're talking about this personal work that's leading up to that. And, and. So hang on one sec. Did I say yeah. I got my black belt in 1992? Cause that was a, I got my black belt in 1994. I do. I, I don't remember, but that's, but that's okay. Right. Yeah. 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 That's, a, that's okay. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm working with these, these rough themes and, and, yep. and it's, this progression is really interesting. And how do I want to, there's a feeling and I'm trying to put it into words so I can, so I can ask it, but we'll, we'll take the obvious way. The, the wandering, the uncertainty, um, the things that didn't pan out. Do you regret them? No. Well, I, do I wish I had stayed with martial arts from 78 on? You bet. Do I wish I didn't wander and got my life started earlier? You bet. But I look at life for where it is. Okay. And the reality is um, life can be a struggle. I live a fantastic life. I'm very happy. I have one wonderful wife, fantastic family, lots of challenges. We adopted one of my students. That's been a big challenge. Um, you know, throw COVID on top of all this stuff. Mm. Lots of challenges, but I love life. And when I look back at th- those were experiences of my life coming from where I was, I understand why I went through. Them. I'm also happy that I started that transition in the eighties, uh, even though I, like I said, it took me a decade, right. To really get in what that book was teaching me. Um, and, and you had to get some successes in life to see that, Oh, I can do this. You talked about the impact of, of your father and your father's personality and, and, you know, kind of what he handed you for, for uh, your own personal view. As you started to kind of unpack and, and let's face it to a certain degree, shed some of what he had placed on your shoulders. Did that change your relationship with him at all? So we went through a lot of different periods. Um, You know, when I was starting to come out of my shell and stuff, we definitely butted heads. Um, I do cherish it. He he died in 2002. Um, He did see me graduate college. He did see me get my black belt. Um, I think today he would be very happy. Um, But his upbringing was very, very tough. Um, Born in 1939, um, single mom. Um, You know, he, he... I know in my heart, he gave me everything he had as a father. Um, It's just that how he looked at himself as opposed to how he looked at me, but it did come through. 
Um, after the college and, and starting to get some success, I think he started seeing things, right? Um, definitely the last few years, I'm thankful for those years. Did your successes, even if they weren't as fully fledged while he was alive as they are now, did that start to change anything for him? Did he start to look at himself differently? Um, I don't know uh, for sure. Um, be a good question for my mom today, right? Um, but um, I know how him and I talked changed. Hmm. Right. Um, How so? Well, um, if, if you don't mind. No, no. You know, I, I don't hide. I, I wear my life on my sleeve. Um, so when I went to college, my dad said it was not a wise idea. Right. And he didn't believe I would graduate. And waste of a, money. You thought it would be a waste of money for you. No, and, and, and to his credit, you know, I'm going to say it. My track record had shown that it wasn't. I wasn't successful at things. Right. Right. But on the other end, my wife was saying, you could do this. Back then, girlfriend, right? Um, so when I graduated in three years, working full time, getting my black belt in that time, commuting an hour and 10 minutes one way, it showed him that, you know, we can do things, right? Um, so I definitely was getting more respect out of what I was doing with him. Um, he was definitely helpful in getting the financing for my pizza place. I did that with my brother, my mom and uh, my dad put up their house for it. It's kind of risky, but, um, we, we, even though it's not around today, we made sure that my mom and dad were fine mm -hmm. with that bill. Um, but it, it definitely, he was starting to show more respect to what I was trying to do and that things sure. can get done. And I'm hoping that, you know, because his life was very difficult. Um, I do miss him, but I do know he's at peace today. And, um, but I also do know that I showed him um, that life can be successful when, when you're looking at, he looked at the negative a lot because that's what his life was. And you got to look at the positive. You got to look at both, right? Mm -hmm. If you're really planning I feel like I'm an optimist, even in the middle of that COVID crazy in, in, in March of 2020, where I wasn't sure how I was going to survive, right? But I looked at it and say, all right, here's what could be, here's the pitfalls, here's the downfall, but now let's make the plan work. Let's take a look. Transition. Okay. We've got the pieces in place now that I can ask this question that now I actually has words and I can define it. I go on my gut when I do most of these shows. I don't always know why I'm asking things. I've just learned to trust, you know, seven years, hundreds of interviews, you know, I just, I trust my gut now. When we, when we look at these kind of two phases, we've got the, the early phase where you're kind of banging against a wall, you know, and it, it, there was something about it, it sounds like that felt right, even if it didn't feel right, there was something calling you to training, calling you back when you left. It, 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 made, it made an impression on you. And, and I would suggest that that impression probably predates you training. It goes back to you seeing something in Kung Fu theater and Bruce Lee films. Yeah. And you, you meet this wonderful person who catalyzes these transitions for you, or maybe it's the book catalyzes these, however you look at it, catalyzes these transitions for you, and you start to embrace your own uh, power. And that threads through, you try a number of things, and you're like, you know what? I'm going to open a school. Was it, was it that? Was it, you know what? This is the thing I'm going to do. Pizza didn't work out. I'm going to open a school. Well, and from where I came from, we were told that you can't earn a living doing martial arts. Even our grandmaster, he sat right here in my, my living room. He said, ah, Daryl, karate man, poor man. Maybe you better <laughs> have a job. Um, and, and so the reality is I wanted it to work. I've heard about very successful schools, right? 
Um, it was definitely in my heart. I, you know, when I first started teaching on my own, I said, you know, I, I, I want to um, teach so I can help other people. Right. Definitely, even though there was bumps and bruises along the way for me, I was seeing a difference in who I was and how I felt when I was in class. Right. Because I have lots of times where I was in and out. Right. And so um, it, it was something that was definitely in my heart and soul. So I started teaching on my own in 2004, um, same year I went to Okinawa for the first time. Um, it wasn't successful. Mm. Um, I, I was in a couple of YMCAs that was very difficult dealing with them. I eventually moved those two um, locations to my current locations now. And the reality was that the business just, I, I was doing it as a hobby. Did you have a job on top of it? I did not. My wife's school teacher. So she okay. had the health insurance and the regular income and she really wanted me to, you know, so as I talked about lots of transitions early on, um, I tried the karate thing and then the financial collapse of 2008 mm -hmm. hit. I spent seven thousand dollars in ads. Got two students from it, and really turned out well. Um, and so I went to my wife, and I said, "You know, maybe I have to go back, uh, do something different." And she looked at me and said, "Nope, you're stuck. You are a martial art instructor. Figure it out." So once again, Did she train. Did she ever train? Oh, only a little bit. Uh, it was definitely not her cup of tea, especially with me in the same class. But but and, she. Yeah. But she understood you and what made you tick well enough to be able to observe that and, and push you. So what she said, um, so I, I met her um, in the early 90s, right? And that got me into class. So then she saw me. And then mm. with her encouragement, I got my black belt. Mm. And then the pizza place, uh, sorry, the college came, right? Lots of hours. I was still going. And then the pizza place came and there was a couple of year break. And then as the pizza place was starting to wind down, I went from the pizza place to work for Payne Weber as a financial advisor. That was something that I also loved. I'm a numbers person. Um, and so once I closed the pizza place, pizza place was seven days a week. I went in on Monday morning at 11. A lot of times there was a basement there. I slept there. So I came home um, Sunday night. Um, and what got it to close was my son asked my wife if we could go visit daddy at his place. And that was that. Six months later, it was gone. But the um, what, what my wife was seeing, so I was out of martial arts for a couple of years with that pizza place, and then I was back in. She was like, you're a different person. Even if I didn't see it at the time, which I, I'm sure I didn't, she said, you're a different person when you're in class. So when you opened your school, you had all this context for how martial arts was related to your life, what you were like in it, out of it. You experienced some things about training and running a school that you liked and did not like. Most of the people that I know, you know, they, they, they wouldn't go so deep as to call it a manifesto. And most don't even write these things down. But I would imagine that when you set out to open your school, to start teaching for yourself, there were a handful of things you said, my school will be these things. What were those things? Obviously, because of my struggles, one of the big one was bridging the gap and helping kids go from students. I have adults as too, but most of it's mm -hmm. kids, right? Um, going through how to learn that technique and be able to apply it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it's that attitude towards pain for me that I, I needed to shift. And as I told that embarrassing story earlier, you know, I, I tell that to my class all the time and they actually get to watch the video of the doctor pulling the Ooh. out of my fingers. Ooh. Can you send Just us that video? Difference. It's I took the video too. I was holding the camera, taking the video. It, I would love to put that in the show notes for those that want to watch it. Uh, I, can, I can. I don't know about the, the doctor who pulled it. Is there you know, any issues with that? You were paying for the work and it was filmed on your camera. Uh, worst He's a case, great guy. I don't know if he'd care, but I just, you know, but I had it. I'll yeah, if, 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 you, if you, you can send that over. I mean, if, if he ever finds out about it and doesn't like it, we'll, we'll take it down. You know? Okay. Yep. 
but I just, I, you've brought it up a few times and I think people would, there, there's a chunk of the population listening right now. Who, oh, I want to see that. <laughs> I'm not one of those people, but you know, if we can, if we can give them that, I think they might appreciate it. If it's powerful enough for you to share with your students, I think it's, it's powerful. Well, it's that pain, right? I mean, a lot of yeah. times you, know, you, you get a, a whole host of different students coming in the door. Some are like, they don't care about the pain. Let's go. Others like me hated it. And I didn't want my students quitting because of pain, because I learned how to transition through it and get better at it. Um, and you know, one of it is, you know, I do tell my students, if that hurts, don't say, I'll say that felt great. How do you accommodate both ends of the spectrum? How do you accommodate the people who don't mind pain? They, they recognize that it's, you know, either they're, they're, it just doesn't bother them, or maybe they recognize that it is indicative of some, a lesson being learned, but then the other end of the spectrum, you've got folks who were like you as a kid, like me as a kid, were like, that hurts. I don't want to do things that hurt. How do you handle both groups? So a long time ago, my uh, grandmaster, Aza Shimabukuru, was on a TV show. And in that, he said, it's a journey of practice. Um, that's number one. I have that quote on my wall. And number two, um, he said, we all learn the same karate, but all of our karate is different. Okay, and so when you look at those two things, I let the students develop. It's not my pace. I try to encourage them in air quotes, right? Help them go through mm -hmm. it. I want them to get a new belt every six months. I want them to get their black belt in four to five years. I don't know if they will. It's really up to them, but I do strongly encourage them. But I, I take them for where they are. We take that snapshot and we slowly work through it. So if you don't care about the pain, great. You're going to be in, you know, working a little bit easier i'll be honest it's definitely easier martial arts higher. you know getting punched and kicked it's easier if you don't care about the pain but for those that do the reality is it's a little light pain in the beginning right so we do things um to condition you right as little kids it's it's less um, but we'll start with a foam blocker mm. okay and, and that's where, you know, especially in my age group i have little dragons three to five and then we call them warriors from six to eight they're getting hit in the face with a foam blocker. So you're getting used to it a little bit, right? Um, when I went to Okinawa, he has Mac War boards there. Mm. So I bought, brought a couple back with me. And when I first started doing a couple of that, that it was awful, right? But today I could really punch it. I could, you know, hit it on, we, we like to chop the top of it and stuff. That teaches you to not drag your knuckles too when you're punching. Teaches you to stay straight. Is it yes. is it the old school? Is it the canvas cover? Yeah, you bet. I can send oh, you. Oh, you oh. I remember first time. Like, I was on. like, "Why? Oh, because I'm 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 wobbly at contact." Yeah, and that canvas is just to protect the wood, right? It's, much <laughs> it's definitely not for you. No. <laughs> no, might as well be sandpaper. Right, but but that's also a, one of those pieces that I learned. Right, slow and steady. So if you yeah. have an issue with contact. We do certain things. As you get a little older, you stand in a horse stance and with a partner and you will punch the stomach twice and the chest twice, right? Um, for girls, you gotta punch a little higher, right? But you're still getting that contact so that you get a little used to it. So it's a matter of your pace, not mine. So if you don't like getting hit, we start very lightly, mm -hmm. right? You tell me when to go harder. If you like getting hit, you're gonna be saying harder, faster. And then another thing, uh, which led to a very funny look on a parent walking in the door uh, early on was, you know, you could get better at taking a punch to your face by taking punches to your face. Or what we do is we slap each other. And believe it or not. So the, the first time we started doing that, it was a very light touch of the cheek. And you got to say harder. Okay. Mm -hmm. Month in, you know, we're smacking each other really hard. Now you don't really, you know, you're used to that pain in your face. Uh, but that first mom walking in the door, it was very funny. She walked in, she turned her head sideways. She's like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> but it's just a way to get your skin used to and your face used to something. There's a desensitization. And, you know, what, what the, the idea of the blockers, and for those of you who don't know what those are, imagine a short wiffle ball bat with foam on all four sides. Not super soft foam. But it's not rock hard. It's not like 
the foam that goes under a dock you would put in the lake, right? Like it's somewhere in between. If you've never been hit in the face with something like that, your initial instinct is ow, because that's all you have for context. Right. But what I'm loving is, is this recurring theme in how you're presenting information. Let's start with the, the fundamental and let's slowly progress. Not, not fundamental, 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 zero to 60. Now we're full tilt. Let's, and, and even this idea of this slap drill where you're not telling them to go harder, they're inviting their partner to go a little bit harder to help them develop so right. people can move at their own pace. And I think that, that you're, you're isolating something that I see as lacking in a lot of martial arts schools, maybe even the majority of martial arts schools, is that, that ability to kind of self-direct intensity as we progress. And it all roots back to you as a, as a kid, I would imagine, not loving the pain and the getting hit. Yep, I'd agree with that. So you have empathy for that in a way that somebody else may not have empathy. Yep. And, you know, as I had my own kids, there was no way I was going to let them go through it. So we definitely did, did drills at home. You know, I'd be just turning around and whack my son. <laughs> so your kids train? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And do they still? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my son uh, has been two decades in. He's a fourth degree black belt. My daughter um, is just about two decade and a half or so in. And uh, she's a third degree black belt. She runs one of my schools now. Oh, nice. Okay. So was this, was their participation a choice or not? Yes. Well, mix, right? So choice yeah. to start. I didn't make it, make them start. Um did I want them to get to black belt? Yes. Did I want to make sure that they didn't go through the journey that I did with the worried about pain and stuff? And of course my daughter, obviously we all worry about our daughters. Um, worry about my son too, but you know, he could take care of himself. Now, my daughter too. My daughter was in two real life situations and she nailed mm -hmm. them both without any techniques. So I'm very proud right. of what we taught her there. Um, but so when they started, I would take them through and, you know, they would get, I don't think it was bored, overwhelmed or, or stuff at the end of each belt. And so my only push in saying you have to was you have to finish this belt. You have to get to that next belt. And especially with my daughter, you know, it was yellow belt, orange belt, green belt, blue belt, purple belt. All of those belts, I had to fight her through and say, listen, you could quit right after you get this belt. When she got the black belt, that was it. She stopped talking about that. Mm. But so, so I wanted, but I didn't make them do that. Sure. Let's say you can go back. Let's say, you know, I hand you the keys to a time machine. I don't know. Time machines have keys. I, I, hand, you, I hand you the ability <laughs> so. to go back and sit down with you. You know, you're, you're there. You're, you're watching Kung Fu Theater with your friend and your neighbor. And you just kind of wander into the house. And, for some reason, nobody throws you out. You sit down on the couch and you pull young you aside and you say, what do you say about martial arts to young you before you've had that first day? Do you say anything? The biggest thing is what I teach my kids today, my students today, is I would definitely say, you know, slow and steady, get through that hurdles that are bothering you right? There's definitely ways to do that. So do I wish I would be able to do that? Absolutely. Go back and look at, talk about confidence and how to build confidence. Okay. Um, our tagline is a foundation of strength leads to a future of confidence. And that's because we want to find one thing that these kids are doing and build all around it, right? So if you get good at push-ups or sit-ups or, or a punch or a block, whatever it is, we want the lights to start going on and we want to say, you can do that. So I would love to be able to say that to me. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do it, I it, have regrets? I think we all have regrets, right? Do I wish I did a couple of different things? Yes. Do I ultimately regret my path? No, I don't. Could it have been any different? You know, some people say it had to be the way that it was to get where you are. Well, if I didn't go through this, would I be teaching about pain and everything else to my students today and helping them go from learning a technique and all that in the fashion I do today? Maybe not. Probably not. Yeah. I, 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 I like the roots of that. Do that, you call it a motto? 
Uh, our, it's our tagline. Tagline. Our you know, and, and what I'm hearing is you just needed a place to push off of. Yep. That was that first book. You just needed some, some point to, to reference and say, okay, I can go from here. And I think so often, whether we realize it or not, that's what martial arts is for a lot of us. It's the thing that we can go step into. And, and, and I express it as you get back what you put in exactly and only what you put in. Absolutely. And there are very few things in the world that are like that. I could put all the effort in the world and could have from, you know, day one into becoming a great basketball player. I'm five, seven. The numbers were stacked against me regardless. And then throw in my size wasn't going to happen. Right. Not to say that it couldn't have happened, but probably would not have happened. And so th- as a kid, that can be really frustrating. I'm putting all this time in. I'm not getting these results. We are not all, this, this may shock people, we're not all equally intelligent. Some of us can put a lot of time into school and get far poor results than others who put in less work. That's really confusing for kids. Great. But I think martial arts gives us a place that we can push off from. And for so many, it becomes the thing they refer back to, whether it's training in general or maybe a black belt test or whatever, to say, I was able to do that. If I can do that, what else can I do? Can I do this? I bet I can do this. I can do these things. I agree 100%. It's foundation to so many different things in your world. Absolutely. So if people want to reach you, website, social media, anything like that you want to share? Um, so the website is ner1.net, New England Rendocon, the number one.net. Um, we, have, we do have a Facebook account, Instagram. Um, at this point, the social media is getting crazy with how many different things there are out there. So I try there to lot out there. L- limit that, but the, the yeah. website. Yeah. Okay. Great. And your opportunity to decide how we fade here. You've got a bunch of martial artists listening. They, they've stuck around. They've heard your story. They've nodded along, I'm sure, to a lot of the things that you've said. They've smiled. They've probably cringed out of understanding and things that they did themselves. What do you want to say to them? Well, I definitely think that as long as we look at ourselves as opposed to comparing to other people and we slowly but surely get better. One of the big sayings that I've always said is it's not how hard you train, it's how consistent, just slow and consistently train. And no matter what our hurdles are, we got to figure them out and get through them. A wonderful conversation. Thank you for coming on the show, Sensei, and hope to talk to you again soon. Listeners. If you want more, head to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where you're going to find the photos and the videos and the links and the social media and the transcripts and more. Not just for this, but for each and every episode we do and have done. They're all there for you. If you're down to support us and all of our work, you have a few options. You might consider buying one of our books on Amazon, maybe telling others about the show or supporting us on our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. Interested in having me come to your school for a seminar? Just let me know. We'll make it happen. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you're going to get 15% off anything at whistlekick.com from apparel to equipment to programs or any of the other good stuff we've got there. Guest suggestions? Do you have them? I want to hear them. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. Don't forget the whistlekick family page, whistlekick.com slash family, if you're willing to support. Until next time. Train hard, smile, and have a great day.